Well, if you have a Bible, pick it up. We're still standing. We're going to read God's Word together this morning. Um, if you don't have a Bible in church, you can look to the screens. Um, but the house lights, okay, are already on. Um, can we all stand for the reading of God's Word? If you're not standing, please stand with us. We stand to honor God's Word. John and the second chapter this morning. Um, John and chapter 2. And my time starts now. John chapter 2. And um, I'm going to just take it out from the first verse. It's a story that I'm sure you know um, about the first miracle of Jesus. The Bible says on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. In verse 3 the Bible says that they ran out of wine and, and, and all of that. So in verse 5 um, the Bible says that Jesus' mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. And then the Bible goes on to say that there were six water pots that were set and tells us the sizes and all of that. But in verse 7, Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And in verse 8, he said, draw some out now and take to the master of the feast. And the Bible says in verse 10 that when the master of the feast had tasted it, he said, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. When the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now let's just pray for God to speak to us would you hold out your hands as an act of faith this morning God thank you so much that we can gather in your house and that you know everybody I know Lord that you know every story here you know every name you know every person everybody online you see this morning you know what we're going through you know where life is and thank you because you have a plan over our lives and thank you for the power of your word this morning I pray that you're going to make it so simple that we would understand but let it be so profound that we can build our lives upon it this morning give us a word on Sunday that will change our minds Monday. We give you the glory. Thank you for the incredible things you have been doing in this service and in our church. And thank you because Liverpool would win the league. And thank you because I'm married to the most amazing woman in the world. Everybody said amen. Everybody said amen. Amen. Look at somebody next to you and say you'll never walk alone. And um, then you can have your seat this morning. If you're angry, keep standing, whatever. Um, you can have your seat this morning. Right. I need this upstate, man. Okay, so let's get into God's Word this morning. I want to speak to you this morning. Um, just a real simple message that I really trust the Holy Spirit is going to make real to you. Um, today is August 22nd, and August 22nd, 2002, that's 19 years ago, um, I made a decision to follow Jesus. Um, um, and um, I just thought this morning that I could maybe just share a little message, maybe in some way out of just a story, a God story, what um, that might look like. Um, but just a very honestly simple thought that I hope the Holy Spirit would really make real to you. So I, I want to speak to you this morning. Um, oh, matter of fact, can I, can I fill up front seats? I need people cheering here. Can, can, uh, come, show me. Yes, come. You need to be here. Um, okay, yeah, fantastic. Um, you can just advance and fill up. This is like the cheering range. These are the real Christians. There are seats here. Come on. People, feel, feel, feel. Come, come. This is your chance to look like you came early to church. Somebody at the back, that's your chance, but whatever. Thank you so much. Okay, so I want to speak to you this morning on what I would call fillers to drawers. Fillers to drawers. Fillers to, fillers to drawers. And you're like, where's the cupboard? Just calm down. Fillers to fill us to draw us. Right. I, I think there's something in every human being, every one of us, every single human being that just in some way doesn't like to be instructed, doesn't like instructions. Um, um, just maybe at different levels, at some level, at some point, but every one of us in some way or the other refrains, you know, from just that sense of instruction and control um, and what have you. Maybe for you, it's working in a team at work and you just have that supervisor or whatever that, you know, just dishes out instructions and something in you just kind of twinges, like one day I'll be the one giving the instructions, you know, just that kind of a thing. Or maybe it is um, even just growing up and your parents, you know, African parents and stuff like that. Maybe you just resent the idea of being instructed, um, or maybe it's even just driving in traffic and, you know, just a traffic warden telling you to stop or to go and, you know, stuff like that. You just don't necessarily um, get excited about that. And, you know, traffic is a real thing in Nigeria. Traffic, in, especially in some parts of Nigeria, you know, traffic is a real thing. Maybe you are starting work and all of that and you are told yourself that I'm taking this job. When is my closing time? They told you five and you're like, ah, five and I would be home by 5.15, you know, and stuff like that. And it was simply an 
you know, kind of a thing. Uh, you know, and, and so there you are, you close at five and, um, um, and, and whatever. Maybe an Ibado example. Ibado example is something like, I feel like, you know, something like that. Um, or Akpete, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Okay, so, so, um, um, the, the idea anyway is that sometimes you're in traffic and a traffic warden is just um, telling you stop and start and all of that. Uh, especially when the person giving the instruction is not even necessarily so sure about themselves. You know, um, there are traffic wardens that just seem to be complicating the whole situation even more. Like, you pass this side, you pass this side. Now we're all here. What do you, and person say, wait, please be careful. You know, stuff like that. There was this particular traffic warden that I used to pass most mornings. Um, some years ago, and it just it literally remains small for that woman to be caning us. You know, she would tell, go and she, move, move, uh, uh, mommy. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. All right, but um, but but quite honestly, when the person is not too sure about the instructions, or when the instructions don't seem to really be working, it's not convenient to take instructions. Um, so I was thinking about it, even in terms of maybe like a sports team and all of that. So maybe you play for a soccer team and you have this coach um, and all of that. There are different kinds of coaches. There are coaches that, you know, when you take the instructions, last game they told you, do this, do this. And you did that. You scored three goals. You know, I'm happy to take instructions from you, right? But the last game you told me, no, don't go forward. Just be stay here. And, you know, you just spoiled the whole game for me, stuff like that. It makes it difficult to take instructions. So there are different guys. There are many people that call themselves coach, you know. Or some, it's just maybe one NYC guy that was serving in a school, then he gathered some boys, then they start calling Kochi, you know, not, not that type, like Ateta, you know, not, not that type, right? So, I'm, I'm just saying that, anyway, there are coaches you want to take instructions from, you know, when Jogan Club tells you, like, you, you get what I'm trying to say, don't, don't let's go too far, don't let's go too far on that, alright? But, but, but the, the big idea, anyway, is that it's not convenient taking instructions, and then when the person you're even taking instructions from... Um, doesn't necessarily have a track record of instructions that are working. It's not the most convenient thing. And I kind of think that the story we read today, that's like the context of what is happening. So in John chapter 2 um, and verse 5, you know the whole story about Jesus' first miracle and them running out of wine. And in John chapter 2 verse 5, Jesus' mother says those words that whatever he tells you to do, do it. Whatever he tells you to do, do it, whatever, like whatever he tells you, jump, don't ask why, just say how high, you know, whatever he tells you to do, do it, you know, um, and I'm like, who is he, <laughs> like, you know, who is this guy, like, like, we all just came together for this wedding, like, he's a guest, I'm a guest, that, so for context, this is Jesus' first miracle, he's not the walking on water guy, he's not the guy that had multiplied bread and stuff like, for context, this is his first miracle, he just, like, it's a way we don't even know. Um, and you're like, whatever he tells me to do, I should do it. Why should I do it? I'm a guest here or whatever. He's just a guest at the wedding. We're all, we're all figuring out this thing of what wine has finished and let's see what to do and all of that. He just comes. He's gisting with some young boys. You know, Bible scholars believe that, like, all Jesus' disciples were even, like, teenagers, maybe except Peter. So he just has, you know how teenagers can be, right? So he just... Okay, so just like has these teenagers. He, he's not, he doesn't look like a miracle worker. That's what I'm trying to say. And I can see some of the servants who are instructed just trying to like profile him. And now you just kind of look at somebody and just try and like size him up and look up and down and uh, okay, what kind of shoes he wearing? Uh, what kind of sandals does he have on? You know, they're just like trying to check out, is it real leather? You know, like, uh, and stuff like that. And so they're just like profiling him and then they're like, what's his name? And say his name is um, Jesus Joseph. So you like bring out their phone and they just like Google his name. Like, let's just check him out. Jesus Joseph, let's check him out. And then um, he, he basically, you get like three results. Um, one of them is staff list at um, Joseph Carpentry Industries and his name is there okay that's not a big deal then he has a LinkedIn profile but it's empty then then Facebook Facebook so you know Facebook successfully put everybody on Google like when you search for your name Facebook helps your name to come out right you, you know what I'm talking about right right I'll call you out you have searched for your name on Google before stop pretending right and so, so, so basically they, they like see his Facebook profile and it's like oh okay and let me even check out his Facebook profile so you, you like click on it and search and then the first thing you check is like mutual friends so mutual friends uh it's kind of realized now how far so Loki I know my life is not yet very straight I'm trying to sort things out there's this prostitute that me I patronize on weekends but she's mutual friends with me and Jesus. Like, that's Jesus' friend. Of, you, you get like stuff like that. So, so, so why should he then be giving me instructions as to what to do? Um, 
And okay, so, so maybe if the instruction even just comes and it's like something really smart, maybe he, he, he will tick my box. So like, let's hear, we, we're looking for wine. And then he's like, okay, um, go and get water. Go and get water. Come, Philip, come. You have to, you have to. So the Bible says that they had set six um, large water pots and all of that. So this, the, your, I hope you've closed your Bible and your notes. Your service starts. Start filling this while we preach. So... So, so, like, basically, the instruction then is, like, go and get water. I'm like, if you even came up with some instruction, maybe the instruction was something like, um, okay, you know what, when I was starting my carpentry business, we fundraised and stuff like that, and, you know, maybe he gave some very motivational spark that, in fact, before carpentry, I was into poetry. I started my poetry business with a feather. You know, stuff like, maybe, maybe I would even listen to, like, ah, this guy, man, like, vibe me, vibe me, so how can we, you know, and then he tells, you know what, we can just fundraise to buy enough wine for everybody and stuff like, okay. But he basically says, go and start to fill it with water. And the Bible says in John 2 and verse 6 that the Bible says there were, this is just, there were six large, um, six large water pots of stone, all right? Six large, and the Bible says in each one, each one was like 20 or 30 gallons, right? You think more in liters. That's like 480 to 720 liters. That's like a tank, like a big tank. So Jesus basically tells them, like, oh, okay, this guy who has not done anything, like, who is just, like, is a guest like me, says, go and be fetching water. You know, like, like just go and be fetching water. Like, feel, like, empty a tank and bring a tank, basically. Um, and, you know, so while they go and they are fetching, like, walking up and down, um, you know, just doing all the hustle. Jesus, I, I feel like Jesus and his guys are just standing by the side, just gisting, basically. So Jesus, like, Peter, how far? You see, you see the match yesterday. And Peter is like, Jesus, honestly, Man City, I feel like Man City go win league. And Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you, Man City cannot win the league. Li no, uh, sorry, Jerusalem City cannot win the league. Forget Gra Gra. Jesus is like, Liverpool would win the league. Verily, verily, I assure you. Except the son of man, you know, things like that. So, so, so basically, He's just chasing with these guys. And there you are, fetching water. See, he has not even yet come back with the first one. You know, there you are, fetching water. It doesn't make sense. Did they get what they even said they needed? So, I feel like on each trip, there are all those questions you would even be asking yourself. Like, we're fetching water for for wine. You know, like, each time you go and come, you draw, you go, you come, it doesn't seem to add up. And um, I just really think, honestly, like that's the, that's, that's, that's what this story is going to look like many times. Um, and so I, I, see, I see him coming with his first trip. But guys, um, interns in Sycamore Church work very hard. I need, I need you guys to encourage him as he, as he comes. As he comes. Oh, okay, he's coming in from this door. Uh, please, can you help him open this door? Yeah, yeah, fantastic. There you go. Wow, 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 wow. It's carrying 25 liters like it's nothing. Like, it's not even feeling it. I'm feeling it, huh? Mm -hmm. hey, are you starting to sweat? No, poor no. You're feeling. You're going to feel. Uh -huh. So, as Jesus is like, so he's like, feeling. Jesus is like, hey, hey. that, that, that uh, money go yesterday. How you see how? <laughs> like, like, how you see how, right? Yeah. The issue is that. If you feel this whole thing, I'm not sure we'll still be here. So we might finish service and you'll still be fetching water. Mm. But Bible says it's like 480 liters at the minimum. That's, it's not more than that. Stop shaking it. <laughs> Stop shaking it. It's not more than that. Okay, just go and sit down. Like, go, go. <laughs> um, but. You know, when they come to Jesus and so, you know, in all of that, they come and they're like, you know, it's full. I can even see the attitude on the guy's face like, oh yeah, oh, we're filled. It. <laughs> you know? Because the Bible actually says that they filled it to the brim. To the brim. They filled it to the brim. They come and it's full. Okay. And Jesus now says, oh, I, uh, okay. Peter, back one minute. Um, take some to the master of the feast. <laughs> uh, take what? Water. Take to the master of the feast. <laughs> you know. And as I, as I, honestly, friends, as I look over, like I said, 19 years, for me personally, walking a God story, walking, trying to build a Jesus journey, 
Um, I've made mistakes. I hope I'm, by saying 19 years, I hope I don't, I'm not making it sound like, you know, whoa, you know, I've made mistakes. I've had my failures. I've cried. I've done all of that. But as I look at what we read today in this story, I honestly think it's like a parable of what every God story would look like. I honestly think it's like a shape. It's like, like a type of what every God story would look like. And so let me give you three things about a God story. It, it can be a God story of your own life. You know, it can be a God story of a relationship, of anything. But, but just what it's like building a God story. I'll tell you three things this morning that I hope you add. Then I'll add one bonus point. Give you a bonus point. <laughs> so, number one, number one, number one, all right? And the gist is that the second series guys love my points and that you guys are really going to vibe it. All of that. So, number one, a God story starts with inviting Jesus. Yeah. A God story starts with just inviting Jesus. And, and you know what I want to say today? Because we read the story about wine running out and all of that happening. But let's track it to where it starts. In Jonah chapter 2, when you start from the beginning, the Bible says there was a wedding. And by verse 2, the Bible says that Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. A God story starts by inviting Jesus. Listen, it doesn't start by impressing Jesus. It starts by inviting Jesus. We think about a working of God in our lives. And we think about, you know, like impressing Jesus. Like, you know, doing the big part and working on my way to make Jesus impressed with my life but listen it starts by a simple invitation it starts by inviting Jesus it doesn't start by you working your way to where Jesus is no it starts by you opening the doors for Jesus to come to where you are a God story starts by just allowing him to where you are a God story starts by saying this is the place this is where I am and I can invite Jesus to where it doesn't start with human effort to reach him it starts with an invitation that brings him in and listen, I want to remind us this morning that the line between life and death, the line between damnation and life is still Jesus. Jesus is still that line that we cross into life. Jesus is still that line that, that opens the doors to life. Jesus says in John 14 and verse 6, he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He doesn't say I'm one of the ways or I am a way. He says I am the way. If there is a way, it is Jesus. If there is truth, it is Jesus. If there is life, it is Jesus. A God story starts not by working our way up. A God story starts not by changing geography. A God, a God story starts not by earning more. A God story starts not by changing your income. Multiple streams of income. A God story starts with Jesus. Jesus is life. First John and chapter 5 and verse 11 into 12, it says, This is the testimony that God has given us life and the life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. It doesn't matter what you earn. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter, you know, how many stamps on your passport. It doesn't matter how many relationships you have. Listen, the mark of life is Jesus. The point where life starts is Jesus. A God story starts by inviting Jesus. How many times do we sit down in our misery and we're like, oh, I would really love to, to have a God story about my life, a God story about my business, a God story about my marriage, a God story about my home, a God story about that relationship. I would really love to have a God story about my career. But we think about a God story starting from the point of how much more we can do and how we can impress and how we can work our way. A God story starts by inviting Jesus. And I just want to say to us this morning, if you have made that first big step of inviting Jesus, I pray that a generation and the world will not make you undermine what you've got. I pray that a generation will not make you feel like, oh, you have Jesus, but, you know, all the other things you don't have and how life, you know, and all of that. And listen, the truth is we have issues. There's no wine in the party. The truth is we've run out of wine and all of that. But a God story will happen because we invited Jesus. A God story will happen because Jesus was in the party. And we may not have wine. We may not have all the money we may not have everything figured out we may not have the best of everything but listen if we have Jesus in the story then this is a God story if we have Jesus in our home then this is a God story if we have Jesus in that relationship then this is a God story and there are things to figure out but a God story starts when we invite Jesus into the story 
And listen to me, friends. Honestly, you may look at your life right now and you, you have the big one. I have Jesus in my life. But, uh, but the truth is I look at myself and I'm in need and I'm in crisis or I'm in a situation I don't have explanations for. But, but, but when you can go to bed at night saying I am in Christ Jesus, there are many things I have to figure out. We're, 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 we're in an imperfect world. We're in a fallen planet and there's a lot to figure out quite honestly. There are a lot of variables and at times you've cried and at times you can't explain things. But when you can go to bed at night and say I I'm in Christ Jesus. That is the mark of life. He who has the Son of God has life. He who has the Son of God has life. Don't replace that. Don't replace that. When I have this, then I'll have life. When I have this, I'll have a reason to be joyful. When I have this, I'll have peace. When this happens, then, listen, it may not have happened, but if I have Jesus, I have life. It may not have come through, but if I have Jesus, I have life. If I have Jesus, I have a God story going on here. And I just want to say, don't let the world talk you out of it. Don't let the world make you feel all miserable and needy and lacking. I don't care what you gather. I don't care what you pull together. And it's awesome to have all of that. But listen, he who has the son is the person that has life. It is living people that start to sort their issues. All right? It is living people that start to sort their issues. I'm just so grateful that I have life so I can wake up every day to figure things out. Because I have the Son of God, I have life. Amen, anybody? Second big idea I'm going to say this morning, uh, number one, I've just tried to say that a God story starts by inviting Jesus. Second thing this morning, a God story in your life is not just down to divine intention. It leans on human participation. A God story in your life is not just down to divine intention. It's going to lean on human participation it's going to lean on human participation oh what does God intend over my life what is God's will for my life awesome 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 Whew. Baba said when I drink it I should shake my head and then they will believe what I'm saying <laughs> it, got, it got story I'm joking no I'm joking no ha. people are like huh Somebody is now sitting and saying, I still don't believe what you're saying. You don't believe what I'm saying. It's not <laughs> a God story in your life is not just down to divine intention. It leans on human participation. Let me say to you this way, everybody. When we invite Jesus, he then starts to invite us. When we invite Jesus, he then starts to invite us. Jesus starts to say, you know what? I'm invited into this story. Now I invite you into the story. I invite you to start to participate with me. I invite you to start to feel in the natural. I invite you to say, come on, what can you feel? Can you start to feel? Can you start to feel? Jesus says, you know what? This is what we want to make happen now. I'm inviting you into the story of your life. I'm inviting you to participate with me. The Bible says we are co-workers together with God. Jesus says, you know what? Because I'm doing a work that I invite you to be doing the work with me and Jesus will say you know what I'm going to invite you to do what you can do while I do what you cannot do a God story is going to lean on human participation it's not just about Jesus's intention oh what he intends over our lives what does God want me to be here is this where God it's not just about what God intends ah, why are children dying in the world when there's a good it's, listen, it's not just about God's intention it's about human participation human participation and I want to ask this morning what does filling the drums what does filling the water pots look like for you what does it look like in your life what does feeling look like for you? You see, the thing with feeling is that water, I feel, is so natural. I feel like this is a statement of how natural, like water is, like water is what everybody, everybody encounters every day. I mean, assume, I, I guess, you encounter water on your body every day. Sometimes big assumption, but most people, some people, you know, water is so natural. It's so everybody, it's so everybody knows where it is. Everybody knows where the water is. And so Jesus is like, do you know what I'm asking you guys to do? I'm asking you guys to just go and do the most natural things. Um, go and fill it with water. Jesus didn't invite them to a story and say, you know what, I want you guys to calculate the dynamics of, you know, if we're going to change water to wine and this is the quantity we need, I want you guys to calculate. You know, if Jesus just came and said, you know what, there are six water pots and each of these water pots takes about 80 liters. Now, you, 80 times six. I know people that have already failed. You know, my wife. And so, <laughs> 
Oh, yeah, legit, what is it? No, don't worry, don't worry. So, so, so I, know, I know people that just, you know, can't. You're just disqualified. Why are you judging her? Everybody has a weakness. Anyway, so, 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 uh, Jesus is like water. You can do this. Listen, nobody, nobody is going to miss out on a God story because of technicalities. I promise you, nobody, nobody is going to miss out on a move of God because uh, we didn't understand the deep Greek of all the words Jesus was saying. Nobody is going to miss out on a God story because uh, we couldn't read the clouds and the stars and what is the significance of the star of the month in which I was born. <laughs> nobody is going to miss out on a God story because of technicalities. People miss out on a God story because they didn't fetch the water. Fetch the water, fetch water, just fetch water. Do the natural. Listen, when we invite Jesus, he starts to invite us into the story. What does filling water look like for you? So natural. You know where it is. Showing up. Embracing the disciplines. Embracing a sense of responsibility. About just the whole thing that God is doing something. What does that look like in your life? When we say that we follow Jesus, listen, what it means to be a follower of Jesus is to put your faith in Jesus. This thing of being connected to Jesus is a faith thing, okay? And listen to me, everybody, true faith propels actions. True faith in God propels actions. Faith is not just some, you know, I shall said it, I crossed my legs, you know, I say with my mind, I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and all of that, and I just crossed my legs. Faith propels actions. Faith is not a lazy thing. Faith is not just sitting down in a corner like, you know, just useless about things. Faith propels actions. If you really believe anything, you will act accordingly. If I come into, and so, so many times when you say that, everybody says, ah, faith and works. You know, faith is not about works. Listen well, and that's why you need to understand what Paul says in the context of what James says. So what James is telling you is that true faith is not about the works, but true faith will reflect in the works. So let me give it to you this way. If, if I walk in here and I tell everybody that, you know what? This building is on fire. I have started burning from the back. And you now say, eh, okay. And you sit down. You can't tell me you believe what I said. Okay, let me give you an, a more relevant example. If I say everybody, there's one man outside that is giving everybody one million naira. And you say, okay. And you sit down. You still don't get what I'm saying. I mean, I'll just... <laughs> I mean, nobody's even going to say, is it tall people or short people? Just, just. True believing is reflected in corresponding actions. You don't tell me you believe. You don't tell me this is faith. And I don't see it. Faith has a look. Faith has an activity. Faith has an appearance. Faith has an attitude. The Bible says Paul was preaching and he looked at that man. And Paul saw in that man faith to be healed. Faith has a look to it. Faith has a behavior. Faith has an attitude about it. You walk into church, you say, I believe that God is good. There's a way you behave. I believe that God is good. God is good all the time. And there you are. I'm just depressed. You don't believe. There's something missing about your believing. True faith propels actions. I say to people this morning that true faith, if you say, you come and you say, you know what? I really believe that God has a plan for my life. It will propel you to be reading that book. That book of God's heart towards you. That Bible. True faith will behave in a particular way. And I've just learned that, you know what Jesus does is that he invites you. He invites you to say, you invited me? Now I'm inviting you. I invite you to do the natural. To read that book. That book is written in English. Read it. I believe that God is going to use my life. No problem. It will propel you to say what God is already doing. Ah, I want to serve in church. Because I believe God wants to use my life. He propels something. You can't say, I believe there's a great destiny over my life. Seven prophets told my mother. You better let that belief propel you to do something. There is no divine intention that does not lean on human participation. Let every prophet, let them prophesy, let them prophesy lie. Anyone. It will lean on human participation. I believe that, you know, this is a church where God has planted me. Okay, fine. You believe. You will participate. You will put roots in the place God says you should be. There's no divine intention that will not lean on human participation. 
And true faith will propel actions. You know, you know, we make things look like that. That is just God. It's just God. Worship team, how do you guys lead? We don't even know. It's just God. It's just grace. You know? How did you pass? I don't know. It's just grace. It's just grace. Grace propelled action. Eh? Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 1. Paul says, Timothy, I know it's grace. So, but look at this. Be strong in the grace. Eh? I know it's grace. But there is a standing up in grace to be strong. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 10. Paul says, I am what I am, honestly, by the grace of God. Hmm? Eh, and his grace towards me was not in vain. Eh, okay. Full stop. Wait, wait, wait. Semicolon. But I labored more abundantly than they all. You know, say, hey, Paul, was it your works? No, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. I call it a sandwich. You know, you put grace, you feel it. You know, you know, good sandwich. Eh? You put the bread, you put the ham, eh? and fill it with bread. Okay, uh, you put bread, you put my, my, you just, I just, I just, you just, you just need me to, I'm like saying things, you even first nod. They are just doing like, what is that? Okay, bread, my, my bread. Do you understand? Paul says, it is the grace of God, but we feel it. I labor more abundantly. Yet not I. Before you start thinking, no, it's not even me, but it's the grace of God. But you will see that responsibility in a God story. Don't let anybody deceive you. God's hand was on me from when I was a child. Okay. But you labored. But you took responsibility. All right. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 18. Paul says to Timothy, wage a good warfare according to the prophecies that have gone ahead of you. Yeah, the Bible is a book of prophets. There are good things God has in mind for you. But you wake up every day with that sense of, you know, I'm pushing a direction according to God's intentions for my life. I just want to say to people, be serious with this thing, oh. be serious with, oh, God is here, God is here. Be serious with it. Oh. I've learned that in my life. Honestly, I can't say it, you know. Be serious with this thing. There's something about a God story that, you know, just start your attitude towards it. Look at Hebrews 6, 11. We desire that each one of you show, show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. There's a diligence you will show. That's what the Bible calls you to. There's a diligence. Don't, don't, don't play God games. God games do not tell a God story. It will not. You've been going to church for the last three years. You shall go. You shall come. Don't play God games. God games will not tell it. See, no matter how long a rat stays in a garage, it will not become a car. Going to church and just being there, being there. This, connect. Do, do, do something. You see, and shout there. Yeah, rats don't become cars. It does not become car. Don't play God games. Honestly, just don't play God games. Show the same diligence. Are you diligent about the things of God? Are you diligent about wanting to see God in your life? Are you diligent about a God story in your life? You know, when, when in, in the book of Malachi, when God starts to draw this, there's this, one of these days, maybe I'll do a sermon, and there's this comparative thing that God does through scripture in different ways. When the book of Malachi, for example, God's, God is talking about how these guys bring an offering. And then God just throws in this line that, wait, 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 this thing you're doing to me, can you do it to your governors? Can you, you know, that kind of comparative thing, like the way, the kind of attitude, can you do it to, do you understand? And sometimes we honestly have to ask ourselves and say, the kind of diligence I show towards God, it, it, can I do that in, on my job? Can I do that with, do you understand? Can I, if, if this was my marriage, will I still be in that marriage if this is the kind of diligence I give towards it? You know? Third big idea this morning. Um, number one was what? Like you said, number two. Okay. Number three. A God story connects the natural to the supernatural. A God story, I love this. A God story connects the natural to the supernatural. I said connect, converts the natural to the supernatural. A God story converts the natural to the supernatural. If you haven't heard anything I say, please hear this this morning. Because many times what you are doing is in the natural. You are taking responsibility in natural things. You are filling with water. You go, you get the water you know to get. You bring it, you pour it in and all of that. And it all just looks natural. When I say filling your water pot, you're thinking of all these things as natural things. Natural things. I'm showing up. I'm 
reading my Bible, I'm giving myself to, to generosity, I'm praying, I'm serving, I'm giving myself, I'm forgiving, I'm living, I'm loving, I'm standing up in faith. You think of everything you're doing in the natural. But what I just want to say to you this morning is that a God story converts the natural to the supernatural. Because as you read that scripture, the Bible says that Jesus suddenly says to them, draw out now, draw out now. There is always a draw out moment in a God story. We do the feeling, we're feeling, we're feeling, we're doing what we know to do. And then God brings us to the places where he says, you know what, draw out now, draw out now and take it. And it has become wine. When did it become wine? I don't know. I don't know when the water became wine. I don't know when the natural became supernatural but somewhere in a God story the natural becomes supernatural somewhere in a God story all you were doing was just serving and putting your hands and doing what you know to do somewhere in that story it was becoming an anointing over your life it, it was becoming a leadership grace it was becoming a sense of purpose and of calling I don't know when it happens but somewhere in a God story the natural becomes supernatural listen to how Luke says it in Luke 16 and verse 10 says, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. And it says, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous moment, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Listen to verse 12. If you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? You know, just that sense of what I'm doing is another man's. What I'm doing is not the real thing about my life. It's just a natural job. It's just, you know, what I, it's, not, it's not like my sense of purpose. But he says there's a conversion that takes place. There's a conversion that it is your faithfulness in the natural that God converts to the supernatural. Let me say to you this way this morning, everybody. I still believe that our God retains the power to take what is in your hand and use it to fulfill what is in your heart. I still believe that God retains the power to say what you have in your hand. It's just water we can fetch. And then what do you desire in your heart? We desire wine. I still believe that God reserves the power. God retains the power to take what is in your hand and convert it, convert it to what is in your heart. Don't ever undermine the connection between what is in your hand and what is in your heart. No wonder one of God's favorite questions in scripture is what is in your hand. What We will start with what is in your hand. We will start a conversation from Moses, what is in your hand? Jeremiah, what do you see? The five loaves and two fish, what do you have? He will start from where you are in the natural and he will convert it to what is in your heart. In fact, I believe that for everything God works in your heart, for every sense of purpose, for every sense of calling that God works in your heart, he's going to first of all express it as something in your hand. There is nothing God has in your future. There's nothing about destiny, nothing about purpose that your heart is heavy about that is not already something in your hand today. Everything God puts in your heart, he will first of all work it in something in your hand. That's why he says, we'll be faithful with what is another man's. That is what will bring you to what is truly your that sense of purpose in your heart and I've found this through the years again and again God will give you something in your hand it doesn't always look like it a seed doesn't always look like the fruit it just looks like a seed it just looks like the ordinary it just looks like serving it just looks like an opportunity that you know it just looks like the natural the natural what that doesn't look like the wine we're looking for but listen for everything God works in your heart he will first of all express it as something in your hand I just want to say be faithful with natural things just a relationship, just a job. Is they're just my friends, they're just my guys, they're just my people. Be faithful. Oh, in your heart, you have a dream of you know a marriage and a happy home and all of that. Yeah, it's okay. But be faithful with what is in your hand today. It is what is in your hand that God would convert the natural in your hand that God would convert to the supernatural in your heart. In Acts in chapter one, verse twenty, you know the story about when um, they were going to replace Judas, who had hung himself and all of that and the bible says that they were going to pick somebody else to become a disciple and it was a very big deal so peter is speaking and he says this was written in the book of psalms where it says let his home become desolate with no one living in it it also says let someone else take his position so there are basically 12 people who are disciples of jesus one of them has fallen and we want to replace him it was a big deal in that day don't make light of it those were the days where men of god were men of god those were the days where to be an apostle you know these days, maybe you have apostles. In those days, it was apostle. You know, they were, they were, you know, they, 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 they were, they were, they just sit down. You know, the 12, they'll sit down. People will literally go and be selling their land, selling their, I had one land in Banana and I sold it. And they will come. They don't give it to you. They don't transfer it. To, they'll bring it. They'll put it at their feet. Ah, and go. Ah. If you know. And then you now lie. 
So those are the days of lie and die Pentecostal church. Like, you lie, yeah, come and carry a dead body. Like, we don't, we don't even negotiate it. You know, it was, so, so now one of those guys is missing and they're like, oh, we want to pick somebody to come and join them. You know, the Bible actually even says that these guys, the 12 disciples of Jesus, their names are in the foundations of heaven. This is a big deal. So I'm like, okay, okay, we want to pick somebody to this apostolic office. We need to know somebody that can, you know, tell us every word Jesus ever said and, you know, give us the original Greek of it and compare it with the prophecies of, the, of old. And, you know, somebody that, that prays the longest. Somebody that, you know, I would just think that there must be some very spiritual qualifications to be considered, right? Does that, does that make sense? So look at, look at verse 21. He now says, so we must choose a replacement from Judas. What is the qualification? The men who were with us the entire time we were traveling with the Lord Jesus. Are you kidding me? The qualification to enter that, that space of God's working was, who was there? Were you around? Were you present? Were you there? That they said, we are going, you are there. Doors open, I'm there. We have mega prayer night, I'm there. Jesus, I'm there. Just being there. So natural. Everybody can. But some people just don't. You know those things that you're like, so when you are hearing that, ah, they are picking my tires. You're like, ah, my tires. Even my car's four tires. My own tires. But, but, but the point is, you're like, but me too, I can now. I can. Ah, was it just that day I didn't go? I was, I, what was I even doing? I sure I didn't go. What was I doing? I was tired. I didn't feel like, but he was going. He was showing up. So, me too, I could have. Oh, that's the point. It is the natural that becomes supernatural. So what we do is that in our pursuit for the supernatural, what we think is supernatural, we are looking for the spectacular. That's the easiest way to be misled. Nobody chases the spectacular and really finds the supernatural. The supernatural can be spectacular, but not always. Elijah was waiting in one moment and the Bible says there was, there was an earthquake. And he's like, this is spectacular. God was there. The Bible says God was not in it. And there was a fire. And he's like, wow, fire. God was, God was not in it. There was a whirlwind. He's like, wait, wait. God was not there. There was a still small voice. And that carried the presence of God for his life. The supernatural can be spectacular. Does it mean God can never be in a fire? No. Was it not Elijah that called down fire? Was it not in Acts in chapter 2 that fire came upon all of them and God showed up in fire? Does it mean that God cannot be in an earthquake? In Acts 16, was it not an earthquake when they began to sing and all of that and Paul and Silas, their chains were loose? God can show up in these things. But it is not for us to say God must be spectacular. It is for us to stay faithful in the natural and it will birth the supernatural. So natural. When I think about it, I think about the extraordinary. Sometimes I, honestly, as I look over 19 years of walking with Jesus, I have seen the extraordinary. I've seen the extraordinary. But do you know how I think about the extraordinary, to be honest with you? You might think about it and say, wow, this is extraordinary. But I'm like, yes, it is ordinary. It is ordinary. It is so ordinary. It is so, it is extraordinary. It is so ordinary that it is extraordinary. It's the ordinary. It's the natural that becomes the supernatural. It's reading that Bible. It's slipping off on that Bible. As I look over many Bibles I've owned through the years, I've owned many Bibles, and many times pages are torn and all of that. You may be misled to think, wow, you read it so much, you know, that pages tore. It was slip. You slept. You sleep. How do you read Colossians? You start reading and you, you don't just fall asleep. It's, it's, it's so natural. It's, it, I don't care. Don't, not talk about you now. Go and say I want to do Bible in one year. Let's read Leviticus. <laughs> you know, it's okay. Do you know the bigger question for me is what do you do when you wake up? You sleep off reading the Bible and you now say, "Ah, this thing doesn't work." What, what do you mean? That book, Jerry. It's like this guy playing this thing. Playing it. This is amazing gift, you know. But you, you went to keyboard class when you were young. The first day, you just did it. And I said, I cannot do it, Joe. And you left. Is it not showing up naturally every day? Every day. 
more, more, more. The other day I was asking him, I said, how do you do this thing? Do you, like, because sometimes you just play notes, like he just swings his head, then he's like, you know, there's that head swing. And then, I'm like, how do you do that? And he said, he doesn't think about it. It's like a second nature. Ha! I heard that thing. The thing insulted me because me, I'm trying to, second nature. Thank you for convincing me I'm the idiot. You know, second nature. How does it become second nature? By showing up naturally every single time. Just the natural. That's how a God story is told. God will use your life. Show up. It's the very natural things. Pray. Because that's what Christians do. Say, I don't feel like praying. Then pray. Tell God you don't feel like praying. Why are you telling somebody that you don't feel like praying? Tell God that you don't feel like praying. Are you not already praying? It's okay. It's okay. Show up. Be there. Matthias, by being there, had his name in the foundation of heaven. By being there. I'm like, I can't be there now. <sighs> to be there. My life group is meeting. Go. What are they going to discuss? Go! That's the point. Honestly, my journey of this 90 years, I remember, I remember um, when I made a decision to follow Jesus, one of the first things was, I need a place because one of the first things God will do for you is that he'll give you a place. A place to be planted. No tree grows without being planted. Trees do not grow by encountering water. Trees grow by being planted. Okay? Take tree today and say, ah, there's one special water in the bottom. Touch it. There's one special water in the Jebu. Touch it. There's one special water on the mountain. Touch it. A tree will not grow by touching water. A tree will grow by being planted. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Say there's one revival breakthrough in ah, special prayer. Touch. Um, late night special prayer. Touch. Early morning special prayer. Touch. <laughs> there's one powerful touch. Trees do not grow by encountering water. Trees grow by being planted. God will just tell you, see a place, plant. Does it mean it's the best ground? No. Does it mean it's the most right? No. Does it mean there are no issues? No. But just be planted. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord would flourish in the courts of our God. One of the first things I remember God did for me was he gave me a place. Once I could say those words, this is a place I believe God wants me to be. I made up my mind. I will show up. You don't, I show up. I'm there and I don't destroy, I got, I, when they are still, I remember those days, they are, can I be a worker? No, you can't be. They're, they're not, you have to do one semester. You know, campus, you first do one semester. Okay. Leaders meet in the morning to pray. I think it was 7.30. They used to meet in the morning to pray before 8 o'clock. So I'm there before the leaders. I'll just be outside waiting. Show up. Show up. There's an attitude that faith has. I believe this is where God wants me to be. Before I found the place, I'm everywhere. But when I find my place, my roots will go deeper. I behave like somebody that God says be there. God says, I'm, come, stay there, I'm coming. You stay, you plant yourself. It's the natural things. I tell people, I was saying in first service that honestly, I, I hope everything I'm saying is, I hope I'm showing you that if God can use an idiot like me, honestly, an idiot, a knucklehead, foolish enough to destroy my life too many times. When I think of some things I've thought of doing before, like, ah, and I think about desires and plans that I've had and, you know, just things, just... I just feel like God can use any goat. That's why Jesus even said that if you tell these people to keep quiet, I'll use stone to praise me. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying that it's not about people being special. I can use stone. That's my witness to say God can use me. Because if he said I'll bring other people, i say maybe he brought another set of special people. But he can use stone. I'm like, ah, me and stone, I, still, I can still carry the stone and outsmart the stone, <laughs> hopefully. It's the natural. Let me look at somebody and say God converts the natural to supernatural. God converts the natural to supernatural. My bonus point this morning, as I make ready to close, my bonus point this morning is that um, as you think about yourself in a journey of, you know, building a God story and what that would look like in your life, I don't know where you are. Like I say, whether a God story in your life or, you know, your home, your marriage, um, your raising your children, trying to build a God story over your children, your career, your business, um, you know, and all of that. As you think about it, my bonus point for you this morning, actually my fourth point, but let's call it bonus. Um, my bonus point for you this morning is that your obedience and diligence, your obedience and diligence, oh, please be obedient, please be diligent, please fill the water pot, but your obedience and diligence is because of his obedience and diligence. 
your obedience and diligence is because of his obedience and diligence. Your obedience and diligence is because of his obedience. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes, friends, feeling, 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 feeling the water pots gets tiring. You know, you went back, you, you fetched again, you came back, you poured, you went, you fetched, you came back, you poured. And think about what that looks like in your life, you know, just showing up every day sometimes, giving yourself in a direction, serving, stretching yourself, the disciplines, embracing it sometimes. Don't you have tired days? Don't we all have tired days? Don't we all feel like, you know, even just staying in this journey of obedience and diligence, it costs us, it's tiring. Aaron, don't we all have those seasons in our lives when we're just not seeming to get ourselves and it's like I'm just trying to trudge through and all of that don't we all go through all of that and you know sometimes the truth is obedience and diligence just feels like we're doing the hard work like I'm just doing so much to keep this thing going I'm just being diligent to be a Christian I'm serving God I'm keeping a front foot of my faith I'm not backing in I'm not compromising I'm embracing a sense of responsibility and, and all of that doesn't it get tiring it does and honestly it will get tiring it gets weary but here's what I want you to remember that when you think about it as you know my own obedience and my own diligence I pray you would remember that it is really because of his own obedience and his own diligence and so in Philippians chapter 2 free out Philippians chapter 2 from verse 5 the Bible says let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. The Bible says he became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. You know, what I want to encourage you today, church, is I pray you would remember, look at what Jesus did. Because the first question we should ask, even when we are like, we are going to fill the water pots, the first question I think we should ask is, why is Jesus here? And I'm like, he's here because we invited him. No, we invited him because he's on earth. Why is he even here? He's here because of his own obedience and diligence. He's here because of his own life of surrender. So the reason why we even started to go and say we are obeying is because he had already obeyed. The reason why we go to say we are being diligent is because he is already diligently traveling that journey. And here's how I want you to be thinking in every season of your life that as we are feeling and we're doing all we know to feel, maybe we need to stop and ask, wait, wait, wait a minute. Who really is the filler? Who really is the filler? Because I honestly think that we just get to be the drawers on a God who is the filler. It is his own love. It is his own generosity. It is his own grace that has already filled it for us. And everything we are starting to do. Where are you going to get the water from? Is he not the one that hung the world upon? Not, is he not the one that created all things? Is he not the one that divided land and sea and arranged it all? We get to be filling because he had already filled. And every time you wake up and you say, you know what, I'm standing in responsibility, I pray you would remember it's because he has already taken responsibility for us. That 2,000 years ago on that cross, do you know that he poured out grace? Do you know that 2,000 years on that cross, he paid a price? Do you know that 2,000 years ago on that cross, he loved us with an everlasting love and poured out himself and stretched out himself in obedience so that you can wake up every day of your life and take responsibility in that direction of a God who has already done it all? Do you know that on that cross, as he stretched out his hand, he shouted those words it is finished do you know why he finished it so that you can start so that you can wake up and say today is a day that I will seek God today is a day that I will press that journey today is a day to walk a God story today is a day to give myself in the direction that God calls me to today is a day of fulfilling the purpose of God over my life you can start every day because he had shouted it is finished and I pray today team come that we would remember that we are really just called to a life where in actual fact you know what we're doing is we're drawing we're drawing because he has already failed we are not even the ones initiating this conversation we are in this conversation because he has already failed let's be honest no matter how much water you ever poured in water was never going to become wine do you know why water became wine because he had already filled it with his love do you know why water became wine because his grace was already upon your life do you know why you get to see the miraculous do you know why you get to 
walk in the supernatural? Do you know why you get to walk in the purpose of God? Because he has already filled this conversation with his love and with his grace and his abundance and his generosity towards you. Do you know why you get to say, I'm honoring God with the first 10% of all I have? Because he has already given to you all things that pertain to life and to godliness. Do you know why you can live a generous life? Do you know why you can pour out your life? Because of what he has already finished. Here's how I'm going to end this morning. And it was his love, it was his grace, it was his strength, it was his forgiveness, it was his mercy, it was his goodness, it was his kindness that I'd already filled so that I can start. And my feeling is really a drawing. I like, I like playing tennis. I love to play tennis and that doesn't account for the fact that I've played once. I've played once in the last like 16 months or something. But Tennis is a great game, fantastic game. Matter of fact, the higher you rise in life, you've probably heard the joke that the higher you rise in life, the smaller the ball gets. And so, laborers in a company play football. CEOs play tennis. And then, founders play golf. So, I told that to my father because my father plays basketball. You know, so, so, anyway, anyway but, but the higher you rise, the smaller. But tennis is a great game. I mean, you've probably seen a tennis game and you, you see all the hitting and the passion. And, oh, 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 come on now. Yeah, good. Good stuff. I love, I love it. But there's this thing I found when I started playing tennis that, you know, as you start to improve on your strokes and all of that, and I hope I don't sound proud because maybe somebody's in church and he's like, let's go and have a game. I'm like, I'll think about it, you know. But anyway, I'll, I'll give you a I don't care who you are, except you're better than Adele. But anyway, um, I'm joking, though. I'm joking. Yeah, but half joking, actually. Anyway, so, so, so when you're playing somebody who's just learning and all of that, um, I'm, you know, yeah, generating all the momentum on the game, and it's tough, it's annoying. It's annoying. You hit, you know, ooh, person just struggles to return. It's just annoying. So the best games that you're going to ever play, the best games you're ever going to play is when you're playing a hard hitter. So when you play a hard hitter, what happens is that he gives you a big serve already. Give me a big serve. I give you a big return because there's already pace on the ball. All I'm mastering is reaching your ball, controlling, you know, just mastering my techniques and all of that. But when there's pace on the ball, every hit you hit comes with pace. Do you, do you get what I'm trying to say? It comes with, it comes with, with, with good pace. Um, and so, remember one of those days being on a tennis court and I was just thinking about that a few years ago. I just thought about the fact that this is the beauty of the conversation I'm in with God. The beauty of the conversation I'm in with God is that he already does it big. And so, me just being in that conversation, the simple things look so special. It is already his amazing, incredible love. This is love, not that we love him, but that he sent his son, that he loves us. He sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. My relationship with Jesus is already a big love story. Not because of my strength to love, but because of his strength to love me. And so as I just lift my hands in response, it's like, you are in love with God. I'm like, yes, we have a love story going on. But the big one comes from him. I just get to be a responder. Amen. It's his love. It's his mercy. It's his grace. It's his forgiveness. Listen, the reason why I say yes is because he said the big yes. So my yes looks so powerful. I lift my hands and I say yes to him. And it's a yes that changes death to life. What? My yes took me from death to life. Because he had already said the big yes. The lifting of my hands. We used to sing that song. I'm going to lift my hands till I can reach heaven. The lifting of your hands in worship is literally engaging heaven. Did you hear what you said? That I'm lifting my hands, I'm touching heaven. Wow. You can't even touch the roof of the building. I'm lifting my hands, I'm touching heaven. Do you know why? Because heaven came down to touch us. I get to be the big responder. My yes is so powerful. My yes is so powerful. Yes to God is so powerful because God in Jesus has already said yes to us. The promises of God in him are yea and amen in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you receive God's word this morning? Come on, can we be grateful this morning? Who's grateful for a God story that you can stand in this morning? Who's grateful for a savior that has said yes to you? Who's grateful for a savior that was loyal to you? That took obedience upon the cross that suffered death because of us so that we can have life. Can we really be grateful? Can you clap your hands this morning everybody can we be grateful can we praise him this morning we love you jesus come on let's sing it out this morning in every triumph in every failure you are loyal to me
your hands, that's awesome. Come on. Yes, Lord. when we invite you, you come. Thank you that you invite us to partner with you in a story. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for such incredible, overwhelming grace. We don't deserve it. There's nothing about us that is good enough. There's nothing about us that deserves your presence. But you're the God who loves us with an incredible, incredible love that you delight to dwell in our hearts. Thank you, Jesus. You know, when Jesus, when Jesus was going to die, he was only going to stay in a grave for three days. He didn't buy a grave. He didn't buy a grave because he knew I don't want to stay there long. He borrowed a grave. But you know, when Jesus was coming into your heart, you know, he bought you with a price because he wants to dwell. He's here to stay. He's here to be with us. He's that loving. He's that good a savior who delights to be with us. He's not... He's not out to play games with you. He just wants to love you and be with you and do life with you and lead you in a direction of life you could never make happen for yourself. He wants to convert your natural to supernatural. He wants you to walk in a story that is more than what words could ever make happen. He wants to lead you in life. Walking with Jesus is a journey of life. It's not a journey of hustle. It's not a journey of, you know, just pushing things through. It's a journey of life. He loves us so much that he doesn't leave us the way we are. 19 years ago, I said yes to Jesus and, oh, he's changed my life. Why would you be afraid of God changing your life? Why do you think you know what you want with your life? Oh, he's changed my life. Oh, he's changed my desires. I'm so grateful. My desires were going to ruin me. Oh, no, you don't have a clue. My desires were going to ruin me, but he knows the very framework with which he made me. And he keeps working me, working me. I'm still on a journey, but he keeps working me, working me, working me more and more to conform me with the image of his son. This is the beauty of our lives that we can start to say all things work together for the good of them that love God. Not our good, but those who are the called according to his purpose. Do you know he has a purpose over your life? I don't know who you are in church this morning. And maybe you're just standing somewhere in the middle of everybody. Maybe you're online somewhere. Maybe you've been playing God games. And you want to say today is that day. Today is that day that I really want to stand in a God story. Enough of God games. God games don't, don't take you anywhere. God games don't take you anywhere. Enough of God games. I need a God story. You know, 19 years ago when I made a decision, it was really a boy who grew up in church, who had been in church all my life, who was active and all of that. But on the inside, I knew I was empty. On the inside, I knew I was just, just playing the part. I was just doing their stuff. And it was somebody who was struggling and battling addictions and who said, you know what? I need to know the reality of God. I need to know that there's a real God that I can give my life to. I can't, I can't, I can't. Don't give your life to a church. Don't give your life to a person. No, don't give your life to a system. Give your life to Jesus. 
was a young man who said, you know what, I'm going to say yes to Jesus and I don't understand this whole thing. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to work. But in the sincerity of my heart today, I'm saying yes in surrender. I need a savior. I need to be forgiven. The weight of my sin is heavy on my life. I need forgiveness. I need a savior. And in that surrender, prayed a simple prayer in my room that day. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody came to church today and you're not right with God. You're not in the right place with God. I don't know who you are. I don't know what your story is. But everybody is standing because we want to honor your right to a decision. Maybe you're online, whether you're in the building. I'm going to ask everybody, can we just bow our heads and close our eyes and give a friend an honest moment. Let everybody be thinking about where they are with Jesus today. You know, there's only one way you can be made right with God. We're not called to impress God. We're not called to live our lives to meet up to God's standards. We're called to receive Jesus and then he elevates us. He walks the journey with us. There's only one way you can be made right with God. It's through Jesus. I don't know who you are or how you came about being in church today. Maybe you're new or visiting. Maybe you've been coming. Maybe you're online or in the building. Whether you're young or old really doesn't matter. The question is, are you in a right place with God through Jesus? Maybe at some point in your life you had made a decision. But as we speak today, you know you're living far away. You've made poor choices you've walked away you need to be made right i need forgiveness i need the love of a savior in my life today i'm going to count to three if you say you're speaking to me i want you where you are to put your hand on your chest don't harden your heart don't hold back from god i want you to put your hand on your chest on the count of three are you ready one two three put your hand on your chest where you are god bless you god bless you everybody in this room everybody online god bless you god sees your sincerity god sees it this morning god bless you thank you for your sincerity it's a miracle happening in your life it's the holy spirit nudging your heart thank you god bless you anybody else want to join in in this room or online if you're online anywhere just do it where you are you're not alone he sees you right where you are just put god bless you god bless you i see more hands across the building god bless you we're all going to say prayer together this is a family not a crowd i'm going to ask everybody to join in with you if your hand is on your chest i want you to say it with boldness knowing that god hears your words it's a miracle happening in your life this morning are you ready everybody let's say together heavenly father, heavenly father I, come to I come to you today because you've made a way for me to come, you've made a way for me to come. through the death, through the, death the, burial, the burial and the resurrection, and the resurrection. of your son jesus Say, I believe Jesus went up that cross because of me. I believe he died in my place so that I can live a life that I don't deserve. Say, today, I confess Jesus as my Savior and my Lord. Say, please forgive me of the past and give me a whole new start. Say, I will live for you. I will walk with you. Say, fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your grace. And I'll never be the same. Say, so change me on the inside. And I'll change on the outside. Say, so I'm a child of God. I'm walking a God story. And one day, I'll be with you in heaven. In Jesus' name. And everybody say, Amen. Amen. Who loves the sound of a miracle? Who loves the sound of a miracle? Come on, let's celebrate this morning and thank Jesus. Congratulations, everybody who prayed that prayer this morning. Big congratulations. You know what? We're so proud of you. We're so excited about your decision. If you prayed that prayer in this building, there's going to be people on your way out just waving this little book. It's a Fresh Life devotional. We want to help you. We want to get started. We want to just sow into your journey. It's a gift from our church. It's free of charge. All you need to do is stop by anybody waving that book and tell them, you know what? I prayed that prayer. I want a copy of that. They'll give it to you. They'll love to know how they can support you, how they can pray for you. And we'd just love to help you get you started in that journey. If you're online, there's already information about how you can let us know that you prayed that prayer. We'll would send you resources and just get you established in your journey with Jesus. But one more time, can we give a good, 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 God bless you, congratulations to everybody who prayed. Come on, I really think we can celebrate. This is a miracle. 